Okay guys, so let's let's get started. I'm using my, my lecturer's voice there. Um, okay, so um, I introduced myself earlier on. Uh, my name's oh hi Phil. <laughs> um, my name's uh, Brian McDonald. I am a lecturer at Glasgow Caledonia University. Uh, I teach on the game software development course, as well as do the IGDA stuff. Um, and my main area of interest is 3D graphics, historically. But because of teaching and various other things, I've not done that in years. Uh, but I seem to be getting interested in the game jams and uh, the sort of potential of them, how to make games. So how to make interesting games and experimental games. Um, and one of the things that really interests me is the Oculus Rift. My first experience with, with it was at, uh, uh, at GDC. I, I used it, queued up for ages, it was great. And then I did a game jam, um, Molly Jam. Um, a guy, uh, Jock Finlay, um, he's a resident of Edinburgh. Um, he's uh, ex um, guys who did the shit originally. I can't remember their name. Outerlight? Is that correct? Outerlight. So he's ex Outerlight programmer there. He brought his Oculus Rift. And Molly Jam was all about um, creating games based on Peter Molyneux quotes. And <laughs> it's bonkers. So we made a 40 hour game jam about more Molly, ja Molly Coates, bloody brilliant. And I was going to just do a, like ironic tech text adventure um, type thing using all his quotes. Then Jock said, oh, I've got this Oculus Rift. I've got Unity, but I've never used it. Um, I've never used Unity. Do you want to help me out? So I was like, aye, I'll do half an hour. An hour just to help you out. And ended up doing the whole 40 hours on Oculus Rift. So that's kind of got my first experience of it. And then after that, um, being a sort of academic, I can justify spending money and stuff like this. So I went head of department, oh, there's some nice research projects possibly in this. Um, can we buy a couple? And he went, eh, yeah, go for it. So I bought a couple and got a few, got the two of them last week. So I've been messing about with them since and doing the start of term as well, which is bonkers. So just to get a kind of feel for the audience, so I know where I'm pitching things up, can I get a show of hands, who are programmers in the audience? Oh, wow, nice. Um, designers? Artists? Keen amateurs and hackers and various other folk? Um, cool, right, I'll try and pitch it sort of at the middle. So I'm not trying to patronise programmers, I'm not trying to talk down to designers. I'm going to try and pitch this so that everybody can get things out of it. Um, I apologise if I go too techy. I apologise if I don't go too techy enough. If you do have questions, please give me a shout. Uh, I don't mind you interrupting during the course of, of me chatting. So, a little bit of overview of the Oculus Rift. Who's all aware of the Oculus Rift in this room? Show of hands. Oh, man. Everybody. This is like my lectures. Everybody put your hands up. It's great. Um, <laughs> And the only thing is, I usually don't have alcohol in my lectures. Um, so the Oculus Swift, it's a 3D uh, VR headset. Um, the interesting thing about this is consumer focused. Uh, I've kind of been in academi academia for about seven, eight years, and we've had various headsets through the years. And the biggest thing that I found about them, they were bulky, clunky, horrible to integrate into your software. They would do some weird hacks and screw about with whatever you made. And they weren't focused for consumers. They were there for high-end um, sort of simulation. Or uh, they were there for um, basically just research purposes or whatever. Um, Oculus Rift is just different. It's a consumer-focused device. Once you get a shot of it later on, we're going to have three set up. Um, you'll find it very light very easy to use um, and the great thing is it's focused on the consumer and it's going to come out at a price point hopefully it's cheap for everybody to do to buy and hopefully there's going to be a bit of traction in here at the moment it's still a bit of a curiosity don't get me wrong it's a toy at the moment for me in academia it's, it's kind of brilliant it's, it lets me indulge some of the nice stuff about academia you can get time to play about with tech it's great um, so what we've got at the moment is we've got a dev version so this box here is the development kit. So it comes in this nice lovely plastic box. And I got this last week. I picked the box up, not this, it was a cardboard box. I'm like, that's light, are they selling me the, 
send me the cables or something like that separately. It's incredibly light. And it comes with all the gubbins to get started. Um, so the, the Rift itself, the, the dev version, is going to be, is a simpler version than the consumer one which will be coming out round about this time next year. So the resolution is a bit of an issue. It's 1280 by 800 split between both eyes. So you get 6, 640 uh, by 800 uh, per eye. Um, it's $300 for the, the, the dev kit. Um, so it's, you know, it's within most people's price range. Um, if you're not a sort of ac academic who can kind of uh, blag one off his head of the department. And it's got um, some other stuff in it to deal with orientation. So a free, free axis gyro, a magnetometer, an accelerometer. So to deal with orientation and where you're looking and things like that. And there's a lot of buzz about it. That's partly why a lot of users are here, is just to find extra information about it. But also, there's people seriously get involved in the games industry. So Valve have kind of stepped up the play. Uh, Micah Brash, I think that's how you pronounce his name, is really heavily involved in the Valve side of things. Uh, John Carmack has become CTO. So there's a lot of buzz around about this headset. I think I'm reserving judgment whether it will be a consumer device. I don't think there'll be people in every home using one. But one of the things that I have seen from various talks is this is the start. What's going to happen in 10 years' time? What's going to happen in 20 years' time? Is this the way we're going to be playing experience stuff? Is it going to be something else? So it's worth looking at as a, a sort of device for making stuff, uh, making your games. So one of the things that everybody does when they get the Rift is play stuff. So when I got one, I played various games. And what I'm going to do is talk about some of these games, talk about some of the demos, and some of the lessons I've learned from them. Um, it's kind of design lessons mainly, not tech lessons necessarily, but some things that I'm thinking about in my, my usage of the Rift and what's going to inform what I do with it over this coming year uh, with my students or with various other projects that I work on, game jams or whatever. So I've played around with a lot of stuff there, like Team Fortress 2, Half-Life 2. They have support for Oculus out of the box. You just need to put on a VR flag in the developer console and do some other wee bits and bobs, and it works. It's very nice. Um, there's Portal and various other games work through a, a sort of open source driver called uh, Viro.io, Vire I think that's how you pronounce it. And that basically in, in intercepts some of the Direct3D calls, OpenGL calls, and does the splits. It's not brilliant, it's not perfect, but tell you what, the first, first time I played Portal 2 with this thing on, I went wow, then threw up and then played it for about 10 minutes and got dizzy. You kind of see the potential in something that's highly kinematic and highly you know, immersive 3D experience. The first time I, I looked down in Portal 2 at one of these big drops, I went, wow, I was blown away. So, yes? Did you feel like the lady? Feel like the lady? Yeah, when you shoot it, took photos of the oh. you can see yourself. Oh, no, yeah, I, I always feel like a lady, though. I'm in touch with <laughs> my feminine side, as you can tell, the beard and bald head. But, no, it... it it is an experience to be had. And there's a whole bunch of demos that people have made bespoke for Rift. This stuff here, people have not really made them for Rift. They've been kind of retrofitted or hacked or whatever to get them working. Um, there's some purpose-built demos to experience the Rift. And these are actually cool. And I bought a lot of them with me. And hopefully they work and get a shot of them. The one that I want to highlight, uh, if you're really kind of space geek, uh, like the solar system, planets, etc. Titans of space is properly awesome. You go through a guided tour of the solar system and you can see the scale of stuff. It is actually mind blowing. Uh, I just sat there with my jaw hitting the deck in between drinking whiskies, of course. Um, so the one that I really want to point out is super mega mega. What, what I'm going to mention in my lessons learned section is a lot of this stuff is all about 3D and immersion and just the scale and using like the 3D environment to its max. Super Mega Mega is actually trying to use uh, the Oculus Rift in the actual game. It's a 3D platformer um, for uh, third person. So you're not usually the thing in Rift, you're, you're the first person. That's the whole thing about it. 
and he uses that in the game as a control device to aim where you're shooting, but also to help you solve puzzles. It's really quite interesting. And that's the one I've been most impressed with from a design standpoint, because what they're doing is something different. So we lessons learned, like I'm going to do this through the course of this wee talk. Um, 3D immersive experiences are key. What I mean by that is, and this is one of the problem if you're an indie developer, um, you don't have like a bank of artists, is you need a really nice 3D environment with some really lovely assets and a sense of scale. So these 3D immersive experiences seem to be the thing that are popping out. Uh, things like Titans in Space, uh, things like the Rift Roller Coaster, which gives you a sort of run through. So these 3D immersive experiences are kind of the things that are popping out quite well. Also the use of perspective to draw the player in. Like Rift Coaster, for example, is on the rails. It's just a roller coaster, and you're going through a sort of unreal uh, UDK, Unreal Development Kit sort of demo, and it just takes you through a roller coaster, and it feels like a roller coaster, it's actually properly good, but it's used in perspective, you can see the world, you can see the environment um, the other thing on the rails, one of the things that you find, and I mentioned at the last point there, controls, is a lot of these demos are on the rails, they're guided experiences, the reason for that is to a certain extent, uh, the developer can control what you see. They can control the experience. They can make it tailored to the headset. Then you won't wander and find all the wee kinks. And so, on the rail seems to work. Things that are bad, UI, uh, traditional UI techniques don't really work. You can't just place text. So the 3D HUDs kind of seem to work better. So, like, you may need to reconfigure your UI. Controls. Um, controls are an absolute nightmare. So, just using this for a prop very quickly and I'll destroy it. You put this on and then use mouse and keyboard. Oh my fucking word, that's horrible. <laughs> um, and you'll see it when I show you my, my little demo that I made. Um, you lose, you know, you lose your peripheral vision, you, use, you lose your vision. And if you use a keyboard in any combination of keys, I was playing one thing that told me to press Z. And I'm like, what? Who, I just hit the keyboard flicking up. It just ruins the immersion. It's a demo though, so I'm not, I'm not uh, kind of really getting pissed off on it. But to a certain extent, is it's really key not to use mouse and keyboard, or if you're going to use it, use it intelligently. What works better is a joypad. Joypad works really nicely. The other thing you'll notice, and I'll, I'll mention this again later on, is a lot of the time the Oculus Rift controls your viewpoint, and you can only physically kind of look so far before you have to, it's kind of good when you're on a, a sort of a chair that can spin freely, I can just go like that and whip around the world, but if you've not got that, you need another device to kind of control the, your body movement as well. So joypad is usually used, still some issues in there, um, it's not perfect. Right, so I want to talk about the thing that I made. Um, or help to make, I didn't really, I hate saying I, it was a we effort. Two programmers, uh, an artist, and somebody did the music for us, uh, a sort of a, a youngster who randomly wandered in, we grabbed them. Um, so our game was made for Molly Jam, we called it Doculus Rift. Uh, Jock was the one for puns. Um, and essentially what we did is we made a game based on a quote from Peter Molyneux talking about the fable dog going, this dog is so lifelike it will embarrass you. <laughs> um, so we made a game originally where you played as a dog, you got off the leash and you were going to embarrass your, your owner by pissing on stuff, barking at dogs, generally being a, a little nuisance. Um, and we made this lovely little game where we modelled embarrassment of your owner, different stuff you could go on and we were just using the, the, the Oculus Rift as a, a prop really, just as a thing in the environment. What happened is during the course of the Molly Jam, um, it was a 48 hour event held at Glasgow Cali, uh, one of the design lecturers came down and had a wee play of it, he went, your game's about embarrassment, so see instead of embarrassing your virtual owner, why don't you embarrass the player? So a key decision was made to go, you know what, let's scrap our bug list and just start embarrassing the player. So we start to get the player to act like a dog. So we get you to bark at, this, at the screen, rather than press B to bark, 
you actually have to bark at your screen. Um, order to pee and stuff instead of pressing the P button to pee. You know, we were very, we fought of our controls, you know. Um, you tilt your head and, you know, added bonus for moving your body. Um, and then you would pee. So what we started to find out is using other parts of the Oculus Rift and bringing more stuff in was a kind of key to immersion and make it a more interesting experience. So what, what we did is we, we made a couple of key decisions. If I flick back to that bottom screen, you can see your nose. That is a brilliant thing. And you know, the, seeing your avatar is key. You know, should, if you're doing a, a first person game, you should be able to look down and see yourself. I should be able to look down and see my beer belly, for instance, or I should be able to look and see my arms and what they're doing. It's always about, you know, putting the player, making them feel more immersed. So having that little nose bobbing up and down as you run, that's just beautiful. It's just a lovely key in getting people immersed into the, into the experience. And the other thing we did is to make yourself run faster, you have to bob your head. So you bob your head and you see your wee nose bobbing at the same time. It's just a nice little wonderful thing that kind of keys you in. Perspective is awesome as well. So like the thing that we found is you were a, a wee Scotty dog. Well, it's not really a Scotty. What kind of dog is that? Maybe kind of, I don't know what dog. But it was a small dog. And you're down at knee level. You see a human being, you look up and you go, that's a fucking human being. That is huge. You go up to a tree, it's huge. So that perspective is kind of key as well. The thing that we fell down on was controls. We use mouse and keyboard. Um, and like, see if you've got any personal space issues, I'll apologize later if you play my game. I'll be grabbing your hand and putting it on the WSD keys and the mouse so you can play it. I'm not, well, I might be trying to crack on to you, I don't know. <laughs> it depends how many of these I have, but it's annoying. The reason for that, we couldn't get the joypad, the 360 joypad working on the Mac. Simple as that. But it kind of proved to me again, going back to my other point there, that controls are a thing that you need to really think about if you're developed for this. It's something that you, as a developer, need to go, you know, how, how, do, I, how do I make this a more immersive experience? If I have to, and you will have to do this point, my little demo game, or our little demo game, is you have to kind of sometimes poke out the headset. As soon as you do that, you've broke immersion, and then you're back into that uh, space again. So you need to think about your controls. Joypad is better, um, but I'll make some other recommendations kind of later on. Right, so that's the kind of little bits of experience that I've had for the Rift for a little bit, and I've been playing about with it since. Um, so if you're a developer, if you're a games programmer, there's three kind of main ways that you can develop for the Rift. The one that's the easiest. Can I get a show of hands? Who's, who's, who uses Unity in their day job? Not many, oh, cool. Who uses Unity just for funds, right? Uh, Unity 3D, if you don't know what it is, it's a, a game development environment which is very easy to use cross-platform cross-platform, Mac, Windows, and it spits out to so many other platforms, iOS, Android, web, Mac, uh, Windows, Linux, and if you've got the licenses, all the consoles. It's a great rapid development environment and it's getting adopted everywhere. Um, so everybody's aware of Unity in this room, aren't they? So I don't need to go over it in too much details. Um, UDK, that's Unreal Developers Kit. Um, it's the free version of their Unreal Engine uh, unlock, uh, you basically have to use Unreal Script, which is their only scripting. Their scripting engine, you can't dig around with C++, or you roll your own. And I've messed about with that. I've not done too much with that yet, but just did it for funds, because I, I like, do, I'm like direct 3D guy normally, so it was interesting trying it as a challenge. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is Unity integration, and then I'll do a quick demo of how you get Oculus Rift in to show you how easy it is. And then I will talk about the native stuff, and then I'll do some more recommendations. The Unity integration is the easiest. I mean, it's so easy, you'll, you'll laugh how easy it is. It's uh, the one that's uh, sort of low-hanging fruit. Problem with it, you need Pro. You need Unity Pro, which means you need to pay like a, a grand, roughly dollars. Um, 
You could also get free trial for 30 days. Um, are we recording this, aren't we? There's a subscription as well. You pay like a $75 a year or a month, is it? A month. It's, it's, so you, there is options. Um, but you can get it working for free, but don't, I can't tell you. <laughs> you just copy the DLLs and libraries somewhere else, but I won't tell you where. You will find the information if you want. Um, there's two, the reason you need Pro, supposedly, is the, to do with the, the off-screen rendering um, and the calls to native code. Usually in Unity, uh, na uh, you can call into native code in certain locations and it's only a pro feature. So you can make external calls to your own libraries and various other things. Uh, you can add things like Oculus Rift in or Leap Motion or various other things if they don't exist uh, natively in Unity. Um, so that's the reason for pro, but I don't think it is a solid reason because I've seen people get it working free. Um, sorry for drinking during that there. Um, there's two Unity packages. There's Unity integration which is a, a, if you don't know what a Unity package is, basically Unity has this package format that allows you to import assets, uh, scripts, uh, scenes, etc., etc. It's a great way of sharing stuff. And as soon as you import a package, you've got all that stuff available to use in your, your uh, game. And there's a Tuscany demo which shows you off the, the, the sort of main thing, uh, main, the main features of Autos Rift. Uh, once you integrate the Unity integration package, you import it in, you get two main prefabs. Uh, in Unity, a prefab is like a, a saved game object with all its scripts attached and things like that and all its variables set. Um, you can think of it um, as it's like a serialized object, game object, and you can then just bring uh, that into your scene very easily. Uh, there's two prefabs, an OVR com camera controller and an OVR player con controller. A camera controller is just a camera. It just um, replaces the Unity normal camera and allows you to just look around the scene. The player controller is like an FPS, standard FPS controller, all wired up, ready to go. So as soon as you point that in, it's got some basic collision detection. It's got a capsule collider with a, the, a, a OV camera controller popped on the top of it. Uh, so instantly you've got an FPS walker it's got uh, support for a joypad, support for mouse and keyboard out the bag, and it's very usable. So I'm now going to try and do a little live demo of uh, getting that in and show you how easy it is. So on the train, I made a really crap island. Oh, the lights are really annoying on this. Can some, yeah, please, just for perfect. Can everybody see that okay? So um, this is Unity. Everybody, has everybody seen this environment before? It's effectively, uh, you've got a 3D window. If you're used to Max, Maya, you can kind of see the similarities. But basically, you've got a 3D uh, view of your game. You have your scene view, which shows all the stuff you've put in. You've got a hierarchy of all the game objects that are in that scene. You've got your assets. Assets are 3D models, scripts, uh, audio, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And these are usable in here. Um, so basically, what I've done is one of the things Unity's got a very nice thing is a terrain editor. So what you can do is you can plonk, plonks a plane in, and there's all these little tools. All kind of meh, so the resolution is a little bit weird. There we go. So it's got all these tools that allow you to paint vertices, push and pull them around. So that plane you can basically mould. Uh, so I just mess around with this and got a really crappy terrain. I did it. While, while I was on the train. And what I've got here is if I play it, I've got a first person controller. First person controller is a prefab, which is basically a capsule collider, which is a capsule that when it hits the ground, it'll stop and it's got collision detection. You can walk around the environment. So if I play this, you'll see it in action. I'll go full screen here. Um, and there we go, I can walk around. So if you've never used Unity, that took me all five minutes to do on the train. Uh, I use Unity in my day job. Well, not anymore, I don't teach on it now. But um, I use it all the time for game jams and things like that. So you can see there, it's quite a nice thing to have because you can move around. So we have got a basic scene. So 
what you do is you download the Oculus Rift Unity SDK. It's called Integration, but I'll call it Unity SDK. And you have, when you download it, um, you have, I've put it in a dev folder. Um, you've basically got this here, and it's got this thing called a package. Unity packages contains a whole bunch of assets, uh, including prefabs that allow you to do stuff. Um, so I just, what you do is you import that in. So if I just go to import package, custom package, and I just select Oculus Unity integration, and then I import. So I've imported that in. Uh, the first thing you should always do if you're working with Oculus Rift is anything that's got a camera, you should disable it. So the first person controller, just to show you, has a camera hidden under it. Effectively, it's attached, so when it moves, the camera moves. So I just untick that, and that disables it. That makes it un um, disables it in the scene, so it's not using that camera as a main camera. So the Unity package for Oculus Rift has imported all these directories. So it's a wee bit bloody, so excuse that. I think it's just the projector being out of focus. There's a new OVR folder that contains everything to do with Oculus Rift. The thing that you want to look at is the prefabs. There's the two prefabs I've talked about. So I'm just going to dump in the player controller. So to fire that in, I just plonk it in the scene. And then I just move it up. And now if I play it, I've got um, Oculus Rift, and I'm moving the stuff around. And, uh, uh, so that's it. That's the integration. That's it done. Not really, because there's a lot more stuff to do to make it fun and mm -hmm. interesting. But that shows you how easy it is to get it in. Um, in comparison to the native way, it's, it, this is a breeze. So if you're ever going to experiment with Oculus Rift, this is a great experimentation platform. It works really nicely, quickly. You can get stuff in there uh, fairly easily. So um, the thing I want to talk about is what this is kind of doing. And then I'll move on to the native stuff. Um, before, before I go on, has anybody got any questions bef before I shift on? Yes? Um, there, there's basically, can you switch the lights on for me again, please? Thank you. Thank you, guys. Um, so, uh, I haven't, but see, on the, basically what it is, is on UDK about three months ago, four months ago, uh, added the ability to call external C code. So, uh, what, what there is, there's a version of the UDK on the Oculus Rift website you can download, but it's a whole big download of the whole UDK with Oculus Rift support, and the version is kind of lagging behind a wee bit of the, the sort of main trunk of UDK. Um, it basically gives you, um, and I've looked into it just briefly, the docs really, it gives you a sort of player controller that supports the Oculus Rift, and it basically uh, mirrors the C++ side of stuff, so it's really Unreal script over the top of it. So it's really just a matter of getting that controller in, and you've got a UDK scene. It's the same idea. Um, have you, who's used UDK in the audience before? Yeah, so UDK's got, you know, a player controller and it's got all the camera stuff and things like that in there. Effectively, it's a Oculus Rift camera controller. Uh, play, couldn't player controller, it's got all the, the gubbins in it. And it's got some custom shaders as well because of the split view and various other things. Um, so, it, it's just as easy, but the problem I find with UDK is a little bit, like I'm a programmer and I, I find it's a little bit more than I want to learn, like I need to know the, the Unreal Ed and Kismet and Unreal Script and the, so I, I just kind of, I've just not used it yet, but I will get to it. Um, right, should, I, should, I should actually keep the lights off because I was going to explain some of this stuff in here. Can you do that again for us please guys, sorry. Um, right, so I just want to talk about um, a couple of things. Ooh. Ooh. This is intimate. Right. Now I can't see people sticking their tongues out at me and giving me the fingers. That's a bit disturbing. Um, so one of the things I want to talk about, what, what this is actually doing. So if I just show you the low VR camera controller, and this will give you a key understanding what um, this is doing. So 
here's got two other prefabs, camera left, camera right. So essentially what um, it's doing is it's giving you two separate views. So if you think about it, it's kind of replicating what, it's making our eyes effectively. So it's two cameras slightly offset um, from the center. So they've kind of got that sort of distance. So it's got this camera left, camera right. Um, and if I look at the player controller, if I look at the camera left very quickly, it's got a few scripts. And this is why Unity is probably a nice way to go. And there's this correction script, and I'll talk about that in a bit more details, but detail later on when I'm talking about the native stuff. But essentially, the Oculus Rift, because of its lens, distorts the image slightly. So this, this corrects it for you. Um, so it's quite nice in that it's doing a lot of the work for you. Also sets up like a viewport, because that's why we've got the left and right down here. So there's two separate viewports. So it does a lot of work for you. Um, so it's quite nice. It's also got the shaders all ready to go because there is that correction to go. The other thing that's quite nice about it is it's got a whole GUI system. Remember I was saying that GUI was a problem? Um, this has got a nice sort of 3D GUI that works quite nicely with, uh, with the Oculus Rift. Um, and we used it quite a lot in the, the, Mo the Molly Dog game and the, the Molly Jam. Um, so it's got a whole bunch of stuff that makes your life easier. Okay, so let's go back to the presentation and now I can see these all because it's all white. Um, so, um, I've done a quick live thing. Um, so roll on your own. This is where I'm a bit less confident in my, my not my abilities, but more the time that I've had to play around with it. I've only had like over a couple of days playing around with it at home and stuff like that. And the semester started, so it's been dipping in and out. Uh, so a lot of this is culled from the docs and a few of my observations as I go. Um, so roll on your own, and um, that's basically starting from scratch, doing native code. So as a show of hands, who's all C++ programmers in the room? Um, so not many. Um, I would imagine because it's C++, there'll be Python version soon, there'll be a Lua version, there'll be versions for every language under the sun. So to do it from scratch, you need an API. The, the usual two ones of choice is OpenGL or Direct3D. I'm a Direct3D guy, so I may lap sent you some Direct3D terminology when I'm talking about this. I'll try and pitch it so that most people can understand it. If I don't, if I don't, if you don't understand what I'm saying, just shout at me and I'll try to clarify. Um, and it's written in C++, the, the library. It's called libovr. Um, so it's a C++ library and it's actually quite nicely engineered. There's like some nice classes in there to deal with the device, of ch uh, checking for support of the devices, how many devices you've got connected. Um, the capabilities of the device, because uh, this version of Rift is the one you've got now, but there might be more down the line. There's ways of uh, getting sensor information out. There's, you can get the sensor information out by directly pulling the sensor, or you can use a thing called the sensor fusion class, which kind of collates all the stuff together and gives you a more usable format. So the kind of integration steps you go through, and if you've read the docs, you may recognize some of this because I've culled some of it from it. You initialize the library. You have to do that first because it sets up a few things like logging and a memory allocator. If you don't know what that is, is a, they've kind of, as a games programmer, you always want control of, of the memory allocation of your application, especially if you're working on devices that have got limited memory because you might be working, lucky enough to work in the Oculus Rift for a console. Um, an allocator allows you to uh, control how memory is allocated by the library, so it's a quite a nice feature. Um, so you call this thing called system init, which initializes the library. Uh, you do that before you do anything. And then after that, uh, you can go and work with Oculus Rift. And once you're finished with it, you have to call system destroy, which kind of reclaims the memory that's been allocated for some of the governs in initialize. And I'm going very high level, guys, so I'll try. Is that too high, too, too low? Is that too low for folk? Just shout at me if it is. Um, so you enumerate devices, what that means is go checking for the device. You create a head-mounted device, which is one of these. It's an instance of an Oculus Rift. 
and sensor objects to interact with the sensors. Um, the next step is integrate head tracking because one of the things that you want to do as a programmer is you want to get the Oculus Rift working with your camera system. So what you want to be doing is use the Oculus Rift to, to kind of move the viewpoint. So you effectively can use the sensor fusion class which um, gives the orientation in a quaternion um, which is a four element uh, mathematical construct which uh, is uh, rotations around axes um, but you can get it in traditional yaw pitch roll as well um, and it gives you the various angles at the end you can apply the camera to mod uh, modify your orientation um, you may also want to modify movement and gameplay to consider the orientation so you may want to uh, for example find out how far somebody's moved and then move the camera some more so that you can do that full spin or you can add other controllers in. So this just gives you an idea of how that orientation's all mapped. This again is called from the docks. Um, why your pitch and roll? What's interesting is the Z is coming out your head. It's the back, so it's coming from the screen out. So you need to bear that sort of coordinate system in mind when you're working with it. And if you're a direct 3D or an OpenGL guy, you'll understand you need to do some modifications on your coordinate systems. Um, the big thing you have to do is modify the game rendering, and this has the biggest sort of impact um, on, on what you're doing as a graphics person, as a graphics programmer. Um, because you are rendering a um, stereoscopic view, you need to have a 3D scene for each eye, or you have a viewport for each eye, in essence, and two cameras for each eye. So your cameras have to change. So you, you, you effectively have to have two cameras set up and do all you need, the work you usually have to do to set up those cameras um, separately. But you have to compute some additional information that come from the actual capabilities of the device. So the devices are all different and you need some information from that in order to properly compute the the, the matrices that are for the cameras. And I'm trying to keep this, so I don't want to explain it in too much detail, but essentially the projection matrix for each camera is slightly different because of an offset, because of the, the way, it, the, way the, the headset works. And because of the, the nature of the lenses and the nature of the rift, there's some optical distortion. So you have to apply a pixel shader. A pixel shader, is effectively a small program that runs as part of the graphics, process, uh, graphics pipeline. So a, a pixel shader is something that we write as graphics programmers that you bind to the pipeline and gets run in the graphics cards. I'll fudge you my terminology a little bit. But essentially, that has to correct the optical distortions. So it causes a field of view distortions, and you see a color, uh, radial color uh, split so think about Dark Side of the Moon cover and how all the colours come out or Isaac Newton's experiment, the wavelength of the light. Um, but essentially the, the, that distortion happens so you'll see some colour burn around uncorrected uh, Oculus Rift. So you have to uh, write a pixel shader that has a barrel filter which corrects that. A barrel filter is just a type of filter that looks like a barrel and kind of stops that radial distortion. So, and you need to have a custom UI. Uh, 2D UIs will not work very nicely off the shelf. You will need to work with 3D ones. Did I go too low level? No, thanks. Is, uh, just quickly, yes. is, is it just orientation of your view? Is there any kind of positional information? Um, well, there's, um, it's kind of cleaned up for you through the, the sensor fusion class, so you get orientation. Um, information you don't get any sort of real positional information. You can get access to the the magnetometer, which kind of tells you where you're pointing to, but that's got some drift. Um, then you've got the accelerometer; you can get access to that separately, and so the gyro as well. So you can really only get orientation, but you can do some clever things if you you know you can have a reference post and maybe do something intelligent with it, or bring other stuff in like a connect, say you want to go really bonkers um, but yeah it's really orientation so I want to talk about some optimizations 
and then I'm going to finish so we can get actually into the riff. And I'll, I'll do, I've got a couple more slides that I'll finish off very quickly. So uh, optimizations, latency is a big thing. So when I move my head, I expect the image to be updated and things like that. So latency is the key. So your engine of choice has to run at 60 FPS um, and V-Sync's enabled. Um, and basically you have to make sure you've got maximum of two buffers uh, in your swap chain. You can't have more than that. And you have to reduce multi-pass rendering which basically means it's in traditional 3D rendering, to do certain effects, you need to do multiple passes through the pipeline uh, to render correctly. Um, you need to minimize that as much as possible to minimize that latency issues. And also complex shaders. Um, the more time you spend on shaders, the, the less time you've got uh, rendering stuff um, on the screen. So in Unity, uh, shaders are kind of bundled into materials, so keep the number of materials you have in Unity to a minimum. Um, so I'm going to zoom through these sorts of slides. I've picked on some of these points. So some design issues, if you're a designer, uh, you need to think about the controls in a big way. You need to think about how you interact with the, the game. Use the headset, um, but also you need to think about using other devices. Um, immersive environments. Um, what I mean by that is visuals are important but you need to think about your audio scape. Some of the most impressive stuff that I've seen is using the, the sort of 5.1 headphones and the rift. So it's not just uh, visual immersion, but also uh, audio kind of environments kind of come key to this. And consider using the headset just for more than visuals. So myself and my colleague were spitballing ideas about using the Oculus Rift other than giving you a 3D environment. What about projecting one different image to one eye and to another? It'd be fucking awful, but as an experimental game, you know, you could do some interesting things. Like how about a mini-map on one side where you've got the main game there? Or what about faking Google Gra Glass in, in the Oculus Rift? So as a designer, I'm not a designer, I'm a really shit designer. So I'm a programmer, so you guys who are designers can figure some cool stuff you can do with this. And it's experimental. Um, art side of things, um, it's low resolution at the moment, so don't bother about high poly stuff, keep it low. Um, also, we kind of, in our Molly Dog stuff, we asked the, the, the artist to apply a tune shader inside Max to our model and then export it out that way. So they kind of mask some of the rough edges of the low poly. So kind of work with your artists to generate some stuff that makes sense for it. Um, also, if you're creating a first person game, usual thing in first person games are to create a sort of sort of fake torso type thing. We can you're just the arms are like that. Thank you. Gordon Freeman in Half Life Two, all you see is the arms. With the Oculus Rift, you can look down. If you don't see anything there, it breaks a bit of immersion. So what you should do is have some sort of FPS model. Um, and you'll see some of the other games that if you play some of the games with Oculus Rift, they don't have that model, it kind of breaks immersion. All you see is like disembodied arms with a gun. It just it breaks immersion. So your artist, if you're working with an artist or you are an artist, you need to think about um, the, the sort of creating additional assets to kind of do that model. Um, general issue, issues, bloody cables. They get in the way. Um, it's a cable system. You have a cable going from the headset onto the, this unit here. This unit here then has more cables. It's a bit of a pain in the ass, especially if you decide to integrate motion controls. The cable's really short as well. Yes. So, like, I don't want to break my unit, but, you know, I can go here without pulling anything off there. That's about, what, about four or five feet. So it's not perfect. Um, motion sickness can be an issue. Um, I have vertigo. So I played the roller coaster game and was sick. I played Portal 2 and uh, I was nearly sick over my cat. <laughs> motion sickness... I had I, I discovered I had vertigo when I went on the Empire State Building and looked down and went, oh shit, I have vertigo, I nearly fainted. Um, not my, I've, I've been up tall stuff before, but not as tall as that, never since. I just looked down and stuff and I just go, uh. 
So that motion sickness is an issue. I'm talking about vertigo, but motion sickness can be an issue. So if you're developing for a rift, make sure that you don't whip the viewpoint around too much. It might be fun, but see, usually in, in a game, like an FPS game, you get hit by a bullet, camera shakes and all sorts. Don't do that. <laughs> don't do that. Um, the other thing is isolation. I don't know how people play games, but the best way of playing games with a rift is headphones. You block off your peripheral vision. Um, it's quite interesting. My partner was like, what the hell are you doing? And I couldn't hear, so it's quite good, actually. Um, so basically, you, it changes the way you play stuff. And I was chatting to Luke about this, and he put a, a blog post up about it, and he was talking about reaching for a cup of coffee, or in my case, it was a whiskey. And I'm kind of going, that was my whiskey. Shit, I've just spilled it over my table. So you lose that, that sort of thing, and you isolate yourself. So it's not a really... Basically, the, the model I've seen of play, people playing riffs, and you will get a chance to do this. Oh, isn't that cool? Oh, isn't that cool? Aye, that's cool. And then that's it. So it's not an experience you talk through, and it kind of breaks some of the way uh, that you play stuff. Um, audio is an issue, I've mentioned this point at the time. I have got two students doing work in this area, VR and immersion, looking at some of the issues to do with distortion and motion sickness and looking at ways to solve that. Um, and also looking, one of the students is doing, this is more a design student, is looking at VR and task performance. So I've got a couple of research, students who are researching this area. And if you're interested in working with it or talking to me about it, please contact me at that email address or uh, tweet me. Uh, I use Twitter every now and again. It's usually to take pictures of my cats on my board games or to talk about beer or chocolate cake. Uh, but I do tweet some stuff that's interesting, so feel free to tweet me questions or speak to me after the, the thing. So ask me any questions before we crack open the rest. Yes, David. Um, latency, you, you said the minimal latency? No. Because I'm thinking that if you think of the connect, you sync the latency? Blah, blah, blah. The, short answer, the short answer is not out the box. Um, la la latency is controlled. There's many things that kind of impact latency. Uh, if you have a little look at the doc, we've got two versions of latency: actual latency, which is photon, photons to I, and then sort of latency from the software side of things. So you have control over the software side of things. You could design to around about the latency issue, so make your game a bit slower. Algorithmically. There's probably ways around about it. I've not had a big think about it, to be honest with you. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. But the one thing about the Rift Lacey Connect or the Rift. Ooh, shit. Um, I've heard the Connect. Connect. The Rift's like yep. 1,000 Hertz falling. Yep, it's a 1,000 Hertz. So the Connect is the issue right. you're going to have. So you're, you're going to have to almost... Depends what you're doing, actually. Um, yeah, hand controls. Hand controls. Use elite motion, no. Don't, don't use elite motion. Um, oh, fuck off. Uh, what's that? It's terrible. Elite motion is terrible. It's like the elite motion, uh, I've played around with it, but I've not used it, I've not looked at the docks. So your connect is going to be the biggest latency block. Right. You'll probably find that uh, it's waiting, the Oculus is waiting for the connect and waiting for what you're doing. Oh, in and, and, and their own software? Yeah. Um, not off the top of my head, but you could do some <laughs> synchronisation issues and you could probably um, kind of deal with the rendering buffer to hold it back a bit. Right. Um, so, so, Andrew. Um, one other thing you could do, it's pretty popular technique, is just, you should probably do this anyway if you're, if you're writing your own engine, but split up rendering and game <laughs> processing and such. Yep. You can keep on basing right. right. yeah. yeah. every frame independently of rendering. Yes. Yeah, the, the, issues, the, issues you've got, the issues you've got with threading and rendering is depending on your API. What, what's, your, what's your weapon of choice, so to speak? Unfortunately, you're going to use Unity? Yeah. Yep. Whereas, the 
Right. Sorry, on you go. Oh no, it's all right. You're dead to me now. <laughs> I got here in time. There's trades. <laughs> Well, well, I covered all that before you came in, so I don't want to go over it again. <laughs> no, yeah. Is that something that the It's a developer issue. It, it, it doesn't do anything fancy at all. You have to basically, like if you're doing it from scratch, you have to basically have two viewports, two cameras, co correct them, merge them. Basically, it's off-screen rendering you have to do. Um, that's why things like Unity save you a bunch of time because you don't need to do all that. And saying that, there's in the Oculus demos, there's some stuff you can kind of steal. It does a lot of stuff. So that pixel shader I talked about is already there for direct 3D. And if you look at the Mac version, it's got the OGL one. I think I'll need to check again. I'll check when we're in between breaks. So like things like UDK, Unity, have that out of the box. There's probably also you know, some engines like Ogre, uh, which is a graphics engine, that'll probably have all, somebody's done all the shift for that. Airlift engine as well, probably open scene graph and a few of the other open source engines of people. I've not looked, but I bet you Fiverr or somebody's got all the support. So my thing, if you want to play around with it, is Unity or off the shelf engine that's got support. Well, yeah, because that's all set up for you. So the thing that you missed is I did a live demo and everything. It was awesome. Um, but basically, the, the, the camera setup's there for you. So it's got two cameras. It's got the pixel shader that sorts everything out. It's got the viewport set up. It's good to go. Right, right cool. Sorry, guy in the hat. What kind of progress and research are you doing remotely? I, I, I don't know. Like, my, like, see, for me, I, I just, uh, like, I, I think it's, it's one of those things that's a, a design issue to a certain extent. Like, the students are doing the work. Um, one's looking just a general, at the moment, just to let you know, it's a general topic that we give our students, and then they do look at the literature and then focus on the bit that interests them. So I've just put a, a project up, like, look, cool, Oculus Rift, do you want to play with it? But more academic terms than that. Um, <laughs> But essentially, I would like somebody to look at this motion sickness element of it and find out if it's, if it's a human factor, is it a, a factor to do with the, the, sort of the nature of the hardware or the rendering or the game. You know, there's so many elements that can affect that. And a good research project will look at each one of those elements and sum up the research, have a little look at the, the area, try to do some demos and try to do some work around about that. They come up with a hypothesis and test it, essentially. I have not got to that stage because I basically just said I want to have a project in this area and I want students to try it out and see what they can get get to with it. Okay. Um, yeah, sorry. Oh yeah, they have had this issue. With, yeah, it's a, a it's a hum, probably a human factor more than anything else. Because it can be people with inner ear problems and a, a shift of perspective makes them go all wonky and mocks one of their senses. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And see, well, this picks up in one point as well. One point as well, sorry, just kind of forgot to mention it. If you're developing the Rift, can I ask a favour? Don't do what people are doing with 3D movies and go pointy pointy. That's what's happening with all these demos. There's a great demo called Don't Let Go, and all it does is throw spiders in your face. <laughs> <laughs> and you're like, God. <laughs> the audio's really good, but it's, it's, it's a good experience, but it's starting to be overused. It's like 3D movies. Like, um, another thing as well, it shows you retrofitted kind of experiences don't work to a certain extent. So Half-Life 2, even though they've done some work on it, it's not been designed to be Oculus Rift compliant from the start. It's, it's been an experience you're meant to be working through in a first person manner. So if you're a designer, I would love to see what people do with making games for Oculus Rift, not making games that have Oculus Rift support as a plat um, just think of it as a platform. So 
What I'm going to do, sorry Dave, I'll take this one. One of my question. Um, either on the Unity or just the write your own uh, mm -hmm. version of the uh, SDK, mm -hmm. uh, can you have more than one Rift connect to one machine? <coughs> Yes, you can. Well, not. Well, I don't know about Unity. I've not tried it. We can try it. Uh, Andrew, have you tried you can it? With Unity. You can if you roll your own. Yes. Right. Mainly because with Unity, it sets up your cameras ah, side by side. Yeah. And if it's got two rivets, it's just going to set up side by side so, and then render it side by side on top of it again. You're just going to get one root. Ba basically, in Unity, it's got this concept of a main camera as well. And effectively, what it's doing is it's breaking that concept by saying these two cameras are the main camera, and then when you add it, that becomes the main camera. So the what, allows to allow. Yeah, yes, they do, but there might be people who've hacked around it a little bit. Yeah, they allow other Oculus devices as well, like yeah. the latency tester. Yes. Yeah, and the thing about rolling your own, um, if you roll your own, the, the, once you've initialized the system, you can enumerate the devices and find out how many are connected, then you can create as many as you can. Yeah. But the big problem with that, to a certain extent, on one machine is you're going to have issues because what you're doing is you're effectively rendering on all these different screens and there'll be yeah. some, some performance issues. Well, that'd be all right. I was right then. Oh, no, no, no. <laughs> If you're right, assembly from scratch, maybe? Oh, yeah. yeah. <laughs> but no, um, it, would, it would be a problem to a certain extent. Depends on the environment. It'd be interesting. I've not seen, I don't know if anybody else has used Lyft. Rift has seen multiplayer. Rift stuff. So it might make sense to have right. one, one Rift, one machine. Yeah, yeah, exactly, like network play. So guys, I'm going to suggest so we get time to play us because we're going to...